Welcome to the Living Ageless and Bold podcast. Each episode, I bring you amazing women who inspire, educate, and share their experiences and journeys along the way. So grab a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's relax and have some fun hearing what can be accomplished after 55. Hey, everybody. Today's episode is one that everybody needs to listen to because of this crazy world that we are living in. My guest today is Maria Ross, and she is an empathy expert, an empathy advocate. She has a book about empathy. She has a podcast about empathy. She's done a TEDx talk about it. And I just can't wait to dive in on how we can just become more empathetic in life and this world. So welcome, Maria. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it's, you know, it is, it's such a crazy world that we live in. And, um, but, but one of the things about this podcast is, you know, you didn't wake up at, at 51 and say, Ooh, I'm going to change the world and have everyone have more empathy. (laughs) So I kind of like to go back it because it's all a journey. Our lives Mm -hmm. are a journey and to get you to a point where you are an empathy expert and advocate. And how, how did we get to today? Um, It's so funny you ask that because late blooming has been a theme throughout my life. I got married in my 30s. I didn't have my child till I was 41. Um, And so here I am at 51 doing the work that I'm doing. But um, for me, the empathy work started as as a culmination of a lot of different paths. I had actually started my own business as a brand strategist in 2008. And then shortly after that, I actually almost died from a ruptured brain aneurysm. So right after I started my business and I had a miraculous recovery, um, spoiler alert, right? I'm here. And, uh, and I wrote a book about that experience, rebooting my brain. But more importantly, what I learned from that experience and from writing that book is I had ended up volunteering at the hospital in Seattle that was so instrumental to my recovery and my care because my experience as a patient had been so amazing. I felt so respected and seen and valued as a human being. And so when I began volunteering for them, I I kind of saw under the hood and I learned that it wasn't an accident. It wasn't that they had just hired a bunch of really nice people. It was that empathy was intentional in their business model and in how they trained, in their practices, in their policies. I was actually a patient advisor, so they could get the patient point of view when they were developing education materials. And it got me thinking, like, well, if more businesses, regardless of their size, could embrace empathy and help leaders and people within the company strengthen their empathy, that practice at work, at the place where we spend the bulk of our time, was going to spill over into our personal lives and into our relationships and our communities. And and so I embarked on writing the book you referenced, The Empathy Edge, to make the business case for empathy, which was really just my sneaky way of trying to make the world more empathetic, but starting at work. And because my son, um, the other the other thread that led to that was that when my son was about two and a half in about two, 2016, I was reading him all these books about em- about empathy and sharing and compassion, and I was really disheartened by the leadership that I actually saw in our world. So for him, I decided to go, no, there's got to be people out there. There's got to be companies out there, leaders out there who are winning with empathy. And if we actually highlighted more of those models, then that could be the norm and not the outliers. And, and I was thrilled to find so many examples. <laughs> it's great to hear because you, you could see why in a hospital, you know, the nurses, uh, last year we lost my sister's mother-in-law and just, you know, spending five days in the hospital, you know, watching her transition. And, but these nurses were unbelievable, yeah. like, truly. And hospice nurses are, I mean, they are, Angels Their capacity is just yeah. astounding. Uh, yeah. But but so I I get it there. But to go into big corporate America and tell, and I'm being very stereotypical and, yeah. and I never male bash, <laughs> but telling your 60-year-old white CEO male who's yeah. been there for 30 years, yeah. um, you need to show a little empathy. Like yeah. how yeah, how did that go for you? Like how does that how yeah. do we how do we shift that? 
Well, it's interesting because we're in a transition of workplace culture and leadership paradigms. We're actually in a transformation around that. And it was accelerated by the pandemic. But honestly, you know, I wrote my book before the pandemic hit and the research was already going in that direction. It just really got accelerated in terms of what people expect from a workplace culture, what they expect from leadership, what leadership models are most effective. And, um, you know, we've finally finally come to this place of, you know, obviousness, which is that you can't park your humanity at the office door, who you are and how you're impacted by the world around you, whether it's family struggles or personal struggles or dealing with what's going on in the world that impacts your productivity, your engagement, your collaboration at work. And that's where I connect the dots for executives to say, even if it's for selfish motives, if you want a more innovative organization, if you want to retain your employees and save money, if you want to boost revenue by being empathetic with your customers, this is not just a fluffy thing. This is actually a skill you need to build in your people and in yourself so that you can create a more empathetic culture and a more empathetic leadership style, because that's the biggest struggle, I think. And especially we talk about seasoned executives or, you know, 60 plus, even 50 plus, right? It's, I'm empathetic to them because all of a sudden we've changed the rules of the game. Really not all of a sudden, but we're saying, you know, the, the things that you learned about how to be a successful leader, don't do that anymore. Right. We're saying like everything that got you to success over 30 or 40 years. Now you have to have personal conversations. Now you actually have to care about your employees. Now we don't want you to separate work from life because they're intertwined. And so they're, they're stumbling a bit. And so, you know, even, even when they push back, it's out of fear. So the ones that aren't pushing back are trying to embrace the growth mindset and say, actually, this is good for all of us. It's good for me and my stress level. But then the other ones, it's sort of, I need to hold their hand a little bit. And that's where I need to show them the ROI. I need to show them the numbers. I need to show them the business case. Because even if they get to it reluctantly, once they get there, you can't unsee that. You can't, you can't adopt an empathetic mindset and not be impacted by it. So however I need to sort of get them there, however, what it was that phrase, whatever it takes to lead a horse to water, Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I'm going to do. And that's, you know, again, for my son, that's the world I'm trying to create. So, and we didn't even talk about this when we first started, but how, how do you define empathy and comparing empathy and sympathy to two different yeah. things? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, there's, there's so many different definitions of empathy, even when I was researching my book, because it's something that's evolved as we've done more work around brain science, as, as psychology has done more research. Number one, empathy is a trait we're all innately born with as human beings barring any, any outlying psychological um, instances, just for some people, the muscle atrophies over time. But how I define empathy, especially when I'm talking to workplace professionals, is that um, empathy is the ability to see, hear, understand, and where appropriate, feel another person's perspective. So I look at it as a method of information gathering. I'm going to get curious to find out your point of view so that our conversation and our connection can move forward together. And further, what do I do with that information? Now I have to take an action. And that's compassion. Compassion is actually empathy in action. When we talk about sympathy, sympathy is more, um, I kind of see empathy as this ability to be on both sides of the table. And sympathy is more, I'm looking at you across the table. I'm still othering you. And it's usually related with pity. It's usually related with, with something is happening to you and I'm on the outside looking in, which is appropriate in some cases, right? When we sympathize with someone that has lost a dear loved one, um, we're not necessarily connecting with it. We might feel empathy within that sympathy because empathy is really, again, being able to see, hear, and understand. So I think that that's really important to understand that difference because otherwise there's so many myths that stop people from being empathetic at work. Like thinking that it's this overly emotional thing that I have to, you know, I have to sit and cry with my employees on the floor. No, it's just about seeing things from someone else's point of view and not being threatened. I think that's the most important part, not being threatened by that yeah. point of view. Well, no, I think, I mean, you obviously are a workplace expert in this, but even in our everyday lives, you know, look, look at our political culture. I mean, if, if both sides could just come 
together. Yeah. And, and what you said, the listening part, my husband has taught me that he is like in business, he listens and he does so well in his career because he listens and he remembers like he's, yeah. and that's, that's a key, but just to be able to listen to somebody on the other side uh-huh. and have some empathy of, Oh, okay. That's how you feel. Um, right. We could all learn a lot about it in all aspects of our lives. Yeah. And I love that you brought that up specifically because it's empathy is also not agreeing with someone. So I don't have to condone and agree with what you think, but I can have a better understanding of how you got there. And especially around political issues. Like I have certain stances on certain issues, but I try to find out why the other side feels the way they feel. And I walk away going, hmm, that's actually a really interesting point. I still don't agree with you, but now at least we can have a conversation of, but where do we agree? Like where, where is the common ground there? Right. And I wanted to mention, there's a gentleman named Edwin Rutch who runs the center for building a culture of empathy out of Berkeley, California. And to your point about politics, he has, um, created this facilitation technique called empathy circles, which is an exercise in active listening. He trains people for free all over the world on this technique. It's, you can go to empathycircles.com, but he, ran these listening sessions, these empathy circles at the most divisive political rallies we've had in the U.S. over the last few years. And I'm talking divisive political rallies where he got someone from each side of the spectrum into the tent for a facilitated empathy circle. They did not leave converting each other to their ideology. They did leave hugging each other. They, some of them left going again, I I understand more why you think the way you think. I still believe what I believe, and I'm still going to go forth and try to protect what I believe. But now we see each other as human beings. And so I always like to say the goal of empathy is not conversion, it's connection. Wow. I think we need those empathy circles in the upcoming debates. We need all of them. All of, all of them. Yes, completely. Cause you have to be, you can't actually judge when you're doing it's, it's like I said, it's isolating your active listening muscle. And for someone like me, who's a very interactive conversationalist, it was really hard because you can't even you're timed and you don't even ask questions. You don't ask probing questions. I'm literally just reflecting back what I've heard. Even if I think in my own mind, it sounds bonkers. Like, I just need to say it in a non-judgmental way and say, okay, so you're saying the sky is purple and aliens are coming out of the sky. And is that what I heard you say? (laughs) And it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. But amazing that, that to show that it can work, that you can get two people in a room and, uh, you know, and I... I think the media, I think a lot of things have, are just constantly stirring our pots. Mm-hmm. And if we could take it amongst ourselves, mm-hmm. say, okay, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to watch Fox and I'm not going to watch CNN. Yes. And I think, you know, like, let's <laughs> find a happy yeah. middle ground. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about, we're all born with it. Cause I was going to ask you about, mm-hmm. you know, can you, can you teach empathy, but you yeah. were talking about your son and you're reading books and mm-hmm you know, kids are so influential. What is Mm -hmm. it like zero to four, Mm -hmm. you know, what as, because a lot of people listening are going to, you know, are hitting the grandparent stage and, Uh you know, what can we do to help these young people who are growing up in this really is an awful world right now that we're living in and in terms of adversity and things like that, you Mm -hmm. know, how can we get them to be more empathetic and maybe swing that pendulum back? Well, I love that again, because it's the, it's that muscle that we're born with. And there's been studies that show how empathy is present in babies, in young children. It's just a default mechanism for them, but society or upbringing or environment, maybe empathy is not rewarded. It's not modeled. It's not celebrated, whatever. Um, it, it atrophies. And so that's why, just like you said, young children are already so pliable, like keeping them in that mode. The biggest thing you can do is expose them. This is why the book bans scare me so much because the, all the book bans do is, is cut off empathy for young children. So hearing other people's stories, I always like to say like binging on Netflix is actually a great empathy exercise. So watch the documentaries, watch the shows, watch the foreign films, watch, get immersed in other people's lives and learn to flex that muscle of pausing, especially when you're reading with children. Ooh, what do you think the character felt there? 
what do you, what, what, look at the expression on their face. What do you think they're feeling? Getting them to understand that someone else in front of them is feeling something and it might not be what they're feeling at that moment. And so a lot of work with young children, both in education and in other groups, there's a wonderful initiative out of the UK called Empathy Week, where they go into schools, they, they broadcast into schools all over the world and they present people from different backgrounds and cultures and then provide teachers with discussion prompts and and give kids projects and help them make their own film about empathy. So all of these um, initiatives are afoot, which give me hope. But yeah, for all of us, you know, that have kids or have grandkids, the biggest thing you can do to strengthen that empathy is what, like what I said, read books about different people, read um, kids' appro- age-appropriate biographies about different people. Um, ask them questions as you're reading about how the characters are feeling or what they might be thinking, get them to start flexing that muscle at a really young age. And, and it's the little things. I had someone on my podcast who talked about like, if you can just take these little actions with your kids or your grandkids, it makes such a difference. Do you find that, are there any cultures where it's more difficult to do it? Are there, you know, Hmm. because of the way you're raised or maybe the, the attitude towards women or, you know, you know, how do we change it worldwide? (laughs) That's a good question. I mean, I'm not an expert in that field, so I, I can't really comment on that, but I think that's why global efforts such as empathy week out of the UK, which has hit so many countries, um, is so important because it's, it's not, it's not cultural to try to understand someone's point of view. It might be, there might be cultural norms around how we express that or how we connect emotionally with someone. I'm married to a, a man from Scotland and, you know, and I'm an Italian. So we're, <laughs> it's very, it's very different how we express emotions, right? So I think the expression of it can look different. But that ability to, you know, look at empathy and actually let me take a step back because there's actually two sides to empathy and maybe this will help from a cultural perspective. There's cognitive empathy, which is where we use our brain. Like what might they be thinking and feeling? It's a, it's a mental exercise. Emotional empathy or affective empathy is when you're actually connecting with the emotions of that person. And so sometimes you're only using cognitive empathy you know, and sometimes it can lead to emotional empathy, but it doesn't always have to. So, um, I think that's where people have that, like I said, that vision of like empathy means I'm sitting crying next to somebody and you don't have to be, you don't have to be doing the same thing someone's doing to act with compassion. You can just, you can just give them space and be a good listener. You can give them a hug. You can communicate a hard business decision, for example, in a way where you're you're taking into account their point of view and how they might be feeling. So there's ways to still do you know do the things we need to do, but do them do them in an empathetic way. And I think that probably applies culturally as well. What are the what are the culture norms? But can we try to understand someone else's point of view? And maybe through building empathy, maybe we change some of those cultural norms in some of those places. Is there particular verbiage that you recommend? Like, you, you know, you're dealing with somebody, you know, I understand how you feel. Like, you know, there's, you know, in different scenarios, there's yeah. different, different kinds of things. And yeah. for, so to, to, to define and express and actually feel empathy towards yeah. someone, are there, are there particular words we can use? Yeah. One of the best the three magic words I always talk about, especially if you're in a conflict situation, so this can apply at work, but it can apply in your life, is if you are grounded enough, because actually the first stage of empathy is you actually have to practice presence. You have to get your own house in order so you make room in your heart and your mind for another person's point of view, as I said, without defensiveness or fear. So once you're there, when you're in a conflict situation, whether it's at work, whether it's at the Christmas dinner table, <laughs> whether it's at, you know, at the holidays with family is to not react right away, but just get curious. Curiosity is the number one trait of empathic people. So use the three magic words. Tell me more. Tell me more about that. Instead of me automatically jumping in with why I'm right and you're wrong, get the person talking, get the person to help explain their point of view and their perspective and their context. You won't have to guess what it is you know, we say empathy is about seeing something from someone else's perspective, ask them what their perspective is. And so 
you might have to do that a few times. And it does two things. One, it helps lower the temperature if it's a tense situation. Right, right. <laughs> and second, the person feels heard. And that goes a long way to opening up their heart and mind to hear what you have to say. Otherwise, we're just, we're butting heads, right? We're just stuck in our, here's why I'm right and you're wrong scenario. But I use this when I'm facilitating business workshops and things get tense with people. You know, it's like, okay, you've said something very controversial and provocative. People are having reactions to that. Before I jump in and assume, it's kind of like the active listening thing in there too, is tell me more. And I I just find that that's a really great phrase. And then when you reflect, so what I hear you saying is, and try to do it without snark in your voice, right? I, like, I, oh, that's, I was just thinking <laughs> I that. do that with my that's son. So what I hear you saying is right. you just want everything you want when you want it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but try to do it without, without judgment and discernment. So at least you know you're both having the same conversation because that's half the battle is I'm making assumptions about what you're saying and, and what, what you're saying says about you before I've actually really clarified that that is indeed what you're saying. Gosh, and that this goes across all aspects of our lives. Yeah. You know, we're talking about career, but you're talking a fight with your best friend, your, your spouse, kids, your kids, your parents, yeah. your spouse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just want to mention I'm not great at it either. Like I'm constantly strengthening that muscle, and that's why it's a practice. So it's not something that just like going to the gym, we don't just go to the gym for a couple of days and then we're fit for the rest of our lives. So think of empathy as a practice. That's something that you have to constantly be intentional about. Right. And it evolves and it's different with every person. So I think that's why I think that listening, and like I said, and my husband is just so good at that. And that's I amazing. watch him like, gosh, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know that? How do you yeah. know that? Oh, he is. No, he really is. And like I said, he's really used it to his advantage in business. Yeah. Um, because he he'll get to the personal side. They don't even talk business and right. he'll get a deal because of the Is he in empathy. sales? Yeah. Uh well, he owns a construction company. Okay, because so, yes, I was gonna he's in tell sales, you but... I was gonna tell you about a study that showed that the the most successful salespeople are high in both empathy and ambition. Hmm. It's actually a, a a huge success marker for someone who's in sales is the ability to be empathetic and have a conversation with people rather than be talking at them. Does our, do, you know, you have all those, those assessments like disc and things like that. Do any of them use empathy? Is that yeah, on so any the Clifton, of the personality traits? The Clifton strengths finder, specifically one of the, I think it's, there's 32 strengths they target. And one of them is empathy. And actually that exercise was what set me off on the empathy trail was I worked with a coach years ago and found to my surprise that one of my top five strengths was empathy. But then when we parsed it out, it was actually a skill I was using in business and in life, but I didn't really call it that. I was calling it something else. So that one is specifically, and it shows you the shadow side of that too, which, you know, sometimes if you're too empathic and you don't set boundaries, you can burn out you can end up caving into, you know, becoming a people I pleaser. I people yeah. taking advantage of you too. Totally. But that's not, then that's not empathy. That's something else. So that's the other thing I get is like, I don't want to be empathetic as a leader because I don't want people to walk all over me. Well, if you're truly practicing empathy and you have your foundation secure, which is actually the topic of my next book coming out in September, is how to build those five pillars of being a successful and effective empathetic leader. Okay. Can you quickly tell us five or give us one and go yeah, a little no, deep I'm on it? Yeah, no, I'm happy to. Uh, yeah, it's coming out in September. It's called The Empathy Dilemma, which is the thing people struggle with when they're trying to be empathetic. So um, yeah, the, the five pillars are self-awareness, self-care, clarity, decisiveness, and joy. And whether that's building joy into your life or building joy into your team as a leader, those five pillars are really the common threads across every successful empathetic leader that I've interviewed through my book research, through my podcast over the last four or five years. There's really those commonalities keep coming out about why they're able to be empathetic and high performing at the same time. So I'm curious, how does self-care tie into empathy? Because as I was saying earlier, if you don't have your own house in order, you're yeah. on shaky yeah. ground. So you are too busy in self-preservation mode and in protective mode to be able to 
see what another person is feeling or thinking or to to be proactive about what might they be thinking and feeling, to be able to take on another person's point of view without defensiveness or fear. So if you are not taking care of yourself, you have no space in your brain and in your heart to extend that empathy to somebody else. And that's where burnout happens. And so people claim, oh, I'm burning out because I'm empathetic. No, you're burning out because one of these pillars is a little shaky. What did you see any any big transitions or or um differences during COVID? Like because we were, you know, we had our little bubble and then, <laughs> you know, we had our Zoom yeah. and that was kind of it. Did you think people became more empathetic because of what was happening in the world that they became you know, more aware of it? Or what a great question because I've actually thought a little bit about this. On the one hand, we did become more empathetic because the lines between, as an example, work and life blurred. So now bosses were seeing how, you know, working, mo- you know, moms that work outside the home were juggling children and their work, right? Uh, people were literally in your home through Zoom. Um, they were seeing, you know, your guest room, your kids, your dog, the, the chaos, all the things. And we started to humanize each other a little bit more, especially in the workplace. Um, that said, I also think that there's this other side that I haven't explored too much, but it's more anecdotal of, you know, a lot of people forgot how to people during the pandemic, during lockdown. And so they, they became very insular. They became very like, who's in my bubble and my tribe and like forgetting how to read people and how to take those cues and sort of take that pause Um, And especially, you know, I know that I've talked to some educators, they did see that social development hindered in young children because they weren't playing with each other and they weren't learning those lessons on the playground of, you know, hey, when you say something mean to someone that hurts their feelings and how might they feel about that? And that's where the things you do at home become even more important. So I think it's a mixed bag, but I think what I am seeing is that, um, and I'm writing about this in the new book. What we're seeing in the workplace and and maybe the world to a larger extent is this snap back to the status quo. People with the with the mindset of like, oh, everybody had their fun being treated like human beings. Now let's get back to work as an example. Oh, and no. that's based that's based on fear. That's based yeah. on like, I don't know how to lead with this new paradigm. So I'm gonna go back to what I know. And that always happens when you're in the middle of a transformation. You always have people that are going to snap back the other way. But but this young, the young people coming in, I was talking about because my kids are 23 and 25. Uh-huh. My son graduated during COVID, had a uh, job in New York, but New York was closed down. So lived with us for eight months, yeah. working remotely with nobody he ever met. But right. that group is not going to snap back because they didn't know. No, they don't know. There's any nothing different. to snap back to. They only yes. know this yes. side of it. Yes. And there's, there's, there's conflicting studies that talk about Gen Z as an example and younger millennials. There's many studies that talk about the fact that they're, they're one of the most empathetic generations we've seen just because of their access to information and their access to understanding people in different cultures and different places. However, there's also studies that show that they've become less empathetic over time. There's a famous study out of the University of Michigan where they tracked students for years and they found that they saw a, a, a very precipitous dip right around the time screens started to become popular for kids. Um, but I hesitate to blame everything on that. But that study is one that people cite a lot of like, oh, we're losing empathy in our culture. So I, I tend to be the optimist. And I, I like to look to the studies that talk about the fact that Gen Z is very involved. They're activists. They're very concerned with equity and inclusion for, for the most part. If you can you know lump them all, they're very diverse, but if you can lump them all into one group, um, they're a lot more they have their eye more on accepting difference than many previous generations because they are so diverse. They are among the most diverse generations we've ever seen, at least coming into the workforce. And they have access. And they have access. Yeah. Anything. I know you talk about that. I get so upset when people talk about the kids in the screens. I'm like, okay, well, but my kids, like my daughter's best friend, they hadn't lived by each other since they were four. Right. And as they got older, they FaceTime every day. You know, so it's a different, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's where we would talk on the phone. I think it's almost better when you can see somebody on a screen and, <laughs> yeah. and see their reaction and, totally. you know, read body language. 
Yeah. And read cues and tone and all that, all of that. Yeah. Um, I'd have to look at my paper because I, I took something off your website, which I thought was really fascinating that, um, empathy is number one for new product innovation success. Um, 87% of CEOs agree the company's financial performance is tied to empathy. 92% of team members would be more likely, uh, to stay with their company. If business leaders emphasize, em- empathized with their needs. Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty big numbers. Yeah. These are the things that this is where we talk about the ROI of it. Um, and there's even more numbers around customer loyalty and what they expect from brands and companies. I think it's in like, I can't remember the exact statistic off the top of my head, but it's something like eight out of 10 or nine out of 10 customers feel that empathy is the most important element in a successful customer and experience, even if they're calling support and their, their issue is not actually resolved the way they want it to be resolved. If they feel that the company or the person has empathized with them, they leave with a positive impression of that company. And that's one of the most important things, whether it's, you're giving me free stuff because you treated me badly. And now you're going to give me a free coupon that doesn't fly as well. Right. Yeah. So, so Amazon hanging up on me like three times in a row because they couldn't solve my problem. They did not get an A for empathy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, Maria, this absolutely fascinating topic and one that, you know, I I do think being aware of empathy, we can change the world. Like we can getting people to listen. We can, it's, I love what you're doing. Um, and we'll tell, and we'll fail, we'll trip and fall. We won't be great at it all the time. It doesn't mean in we don't, everything. That doesn't mean we stop. In everything we do, yeah. This is you know we we're gonna have setbacks. We're gonna have failures, but yeah. but being aware of it and and cognizant of empathy for sure. Uh, so I end every episode with the same two questions. Um, and I know you just got into your fifties, but um, <laughs> what is the greatest accomplishment? Um, since you've turned 50 and, or it could be coming up that, you know, is happening. Uh, oh, so for me, it's actually making this career pivot. So I had been running along with just my brand strategy business for 15 years. And just in this past year, I decided to go all in on, on what my heart was wanting me to do, which is really talking to leaders and teams about the power of empathy and trying to make the world a better place for my son. I, f- I feel really scared and excited about that business pivot, but so far things are going very well. So, <laughs> but that was a big, that was a big deal. Like I'm starting to think about retirement. And so to just go, okay, let me take this successful business model and completely turn it on its head. Right. So, but that's I feel what we do good about that. Yeah. <laughs> good for you. And then where do you see yourself in 10 years? Oh gosh, hopefully retired. (laughs) But you know, my son's going to be, my son's going to be 18, 19 in 10 years. So, um, hopefully we'll start, we'll start to get our freedom back again. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, my husband and I will be able to travel even more. That's, that's really where we want to spend a lot of our time is traveling. And yeah, it is fun. People get so worried about empty nests and we're, we're relatively new empty nesters. I'm like, no, it's kind of fun. I know. I mean, I miss them, but it's fun. You know what a a friend, a sorority sister of mine, she has three that are all out of the house now. I think the youngest might be graduating from college, but, or has graduated. She calls it, she doesn't call it empty nesting. She calls it bird launching. Oh, that she's not, she's not an empty nester. She's a bird launcher. Launcher. I know she got it from somewhere else, but I was like, I'm stealing it. I like it. That's it's like roots and wings. Like you totally you want them, you know, that's my husband and I look at each other. We're like, I guess we did our job because nobody's interested in staying here, coming back. <laughs> Isn't that the sad part? Like that's when you know you you did your job. You, but we I, did our job. And they're I'm, happy humans. That's and good that's humans. all you can ask for, right? And yeah. hopefully they're empathetic humans and you know, yes, they, it's they all actually good. are. You're talking about that generation. They really are and their friends are and that's great. That's why I'm very hopeful for what's coming. Yes. In the future. Absolutely. Um, Well, Maria Ross, thank you so much for joining us. This was really great. Thank you for listening or for watching this episode of Living Ageless and Bold. If you haven't already, please make sure you hit subscribe. And if you like the episode, I hope that you will give us a great review. You can also head over to livingagelessandbold.com and sign up for information, inspiration, and exclusive opportunities for us. 
women over 55. Thanks for listening. And remember, no matter what you do, keep living ageless and bold.